you know, the knee surgeons, they, they know lots and lots about cartilage. So we should exchange knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. I have got a special guest today because I'm feeling a wee bit of emotion that today is our last episode of season three. And it's coming to you live from Verona where I'm having these face-to-face -face interviews. And the first person I ever interviewed for the podcast uh, three years ago, a great friend and mentor is Miguel Ferreira. Miguel, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks, Kim, for having me here. So, uh, that's all. It's a big pleasure. And I remember three years ago that uh, you, uh, we talked a little bit on your first uh, episode. It was an honor for me. And, uh, well, let's go. That's awesome. Miguel, so, wow, I mean, we've been going for a long time. I mean, but way before that, you were still in South Africa. We operated together. And uh, then the big thing that really kind of took off over the last time since we've spoken is the evidence-based research rhinoplasty group and the telegram group is really incredible. So, so that's one thing I want to delve into. Then also some of the publications, like I don't know where you find the time. Eh? Like I'm busy, but I think Mikko, what a guy. He's publishing, he's teaching, he's operating, and he's taking the most amazing photographs. Oh, I think, uh, well, it's like everything in life. You have to choose uh, the right time to do the right things and you have to follow your instincts. And uh, I think the most important thing is to be focused. If you are focused, it's everything. And uh, if you try to avoid all the, the trash, all the toxic things, things go. But uh, of course, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to deal with the time. My day is 24 hours, of course, like yours. Yeah. And we have to, we lose things, we win things. And uh, it's, it's a life decision that we took all the days. It's not mm -hmm. something like I planned or like the evidence-based group. I thought it would be a, a very small group. Yeah. Then it grows suddenly. And, uh, well. So tell the listeners a little bit more about that group, eh? Yes. So like in the background, how did this start and what's it like now after being going for so yes. many years? It was in the COVID season, you know, we all were at home, okay, and suddenly we were absolutely flooded by many groups in yes. uh, Instagram, in, uh, well, WhatsApp, uh, Telegram, whatever, and uh, suddenly we realized that uh, we could not, it was not easy to split the good information and the bad information, you know. Yes. Too many uh, promotional, self-promotional, absolutely uh, pre and post ops, and uh, we were floating, we were losing time. And uh, well, I'm a strong believer in evidence-based medicine yes. since the beginning. Yeah, and I mean, for the listeners who yes. don't know it, you've also got your PhD that yes. you you got in the yes. last few years yes. as well. Yes. And uh, and I thought, why not make a specific group to talk only about papers? Well, at least it's the best that we have. It's not perfect, but yeah. it's the best that we have. I think we have to deal with the best that we have. We cannot spare, spend time thinking in what we should have. Absolutely. This is what we have. Absolutely. And the best that we have might not be good, but, it, but it's the best. Yeah. And the, the idea is to discuss science based on papers, not yeah. in my feeling, not in my opinion, yeah. not in my pre- and post-op. I don't want to spend... Imagine in 1,000 members group, if each one posts one pre and post up, no. okay, you have 1,000 pre and post up. Yeah. Almost all are very similar. Yeah, yeah. It just means nothing. Yeah. Uh, so I think each time I'm posting something in a group, I'm occupying your time. Yes. And I think that we should, this is a learning process. We are all learning. I'm learning as well as you. Yeah. And I think that in the digital world, we are, now, in the, in the, the, the season of um, have some respect for the other's time. Yes. Because each time we are doing something, we are occupying your time. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even I don't want to do that, yeah. but I do that. Yeah. So all the rules, they are moving. And now I think that the digi digital world, it's a kind of a second, a second life that we have. Yeah. Uh, it's in the season, the right season to talk about ethics. 
uh, and uh, what what should we learn? What should we do to respect the other's time? Or but that's interesting because then I look at some of these guys who have like I don't know two, three, four, five hundred thousand Instagram followers. How the ethics involved there? It's also it's like I don't know. I've got to get my head around this whole social media thing sometimes. <laughs> I think it's absolutely, I'm not talking about that specifically, I'm talking about groups. I mean, yes. Because your Instagram, my Instagram, whatever Instagram, uh, I think it's absolutely impossible and it's even not fair to criticize. Well, there are, you know, some colleagues that they post things that I disagree, absolutely, but it's, they are on their own it's right. The public thing, yeah. It's okay, absolutely okay. The, there's no Batman, no Spider-Man to control that. Yes. And I don't lose one single second discussing yeah. that. You know, it's okay. You do what you want. If yeah. you want to post whatever, it's yeah. okay. It's up to you. Yeah. It's a, I don't but care. Within a closed group, it's a different. In a closed group, it's different because you are in a group. Yeah. You are not on your own. Okay. When you are on your own, it's okay. I have one idea about you. It's very bad. No, it's very bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, I, I like that, 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 that evidence-based research group. I'm scared to post things on that group because yeah. it's, it's so scientific and it's like the big dogs are all on that group. Yes. Oh. You know, that, I think there are two kinds of members there. Uh, the, the vast majority, they would like to say something, but uh, they are afraid. Yeah. Because they, they feel like they are in a court. It's not a court. You, you can post everything you want. Uh, just post free paper, you know, hashtag free paper, yeah. and post the paper, and post your opinion about that. Yeah. And even if no one comments, they will read it. I yeah. think, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 percent. It means almost 400, they read it. Wow. Not specifically the paper, but the, your comment yeah. and the abstract. Yeah. They will read it. Because they came to me privately. Okay. And they say to me, well, I'm not used, I'm not so... Yeah. I feel ashamed because you are a, a huge group and you can... Even the big names. Really? Yes. That's so interesting. Yeah, yes, why not? Uh, it's okay. Uh, sometimes you don't have to comment. Yeah. It's, it's a, a very good paper yeah. or it's okay. Your comment will add anything. It's okay, uh, but well, feel, okay. feel free to go in. So let's chat about something else. We've been working on a paper as well, which we hope to be published imminently, but you've been working on a whole lot of different papers, and the one that really stands out to me, maybe you can tell um, the listeners a bit more about it, is your septal flap. Mm -hmm. Yes. Where does that come from? And explain that a little bit more for you. Yes, I think the, the, well, I thought, what kind of septum would we like to have when we are operating? We would like to have a big septum, a strong septum, and with a high anterior septal angle. Yes. This is the ideal septum to, yeah. to operate. So can we do something to move anatomy to where we want the anatomy to be? Okay. And I thought, why not? Well, there are many options, many good options, of course. And uh, I thought in between a septal extension graft and a columella struct, these are the big, the two big worlds. Yes, yes. Can we do something in between? And I think the septal advancement flap is something in between. So we are doing an advancement of the caudal aspect of the septum, but we have a total control of the contour between the W points, mm -hmm. the caudal aspect of the upper laterals, mm -hmm. okay, and the nasal labial angle. You mm -hmm. can control all that contour. It's not only for support. It's, I would say, mostly for contour. I'm a kind of obsessive with the super tip. Mostly, when we start to do preservation, we are going to start to have super tip problems, yes. depressions. So, I can control that with the septum itself. And I can reinforce with everything. I can put two grafts, three grafts. Okay, most, most of the times I put two grafts, one in each side. First, I describe with one graft in the flap. You just take the, the most cuddle part, then you flip, then you suture just to give strongness, of okay. course. Okay. It must be strong, but you can add the structure that you want. Yes. Yes. Most of the colleagues, they are intrigued about the, the strongness of this flap and it's not uh, yeah. strong enough. 
even mostly in the anterior septal angle because it might tilt. You, you can reinforce it, but you have still a continuity. Okay. So uh, that's it. And it, then you can fix it to the nasal spine or in front of the nasal spine, yeah. like a floating in that tissues. Yeah. And well, certainly I thought on that, why not? And I started to do it. It's now uh, 10 months. So we will have the first one year outcome. Uh, it's not enough, of course, we have to wait, but I'm a strong believer. Then we have the, we work together with the Faculty of Engineering. Yeah, no, they like it. Your, I don't know if it's your brother who works there because you're always working with the Faculty of Engineering and it's so interesting. No, it's really interesting. Yeah. Yes, I think we have lots to learn with orthopedic surgeons. They work a lot with engineering. Mm. And I think we, we have, we are not an island. Okay, rhinoplasty is not an island. We have many common problems that we have with uh, other surgeries, uh, other surgeons. And why should we try to invent something if they did it first? You know, the knee surgeons, they, they know lots and lots about cartilage. So we should exchange knowledge. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I talk a lot with them, with engineering, and uh, I think we can learn a lot and we can improve a lot our, our skills and the outcomes. That's what we want. Tell me, uh, I've heard it said that you shouldn't do preservation until you know how to do structural rhinoplasty. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that comment? Yes, sure. And it's not uh, philosophical. It's, I think preservation is nowadays in, is settling, is yeah. in the air. It's not anymore, in my opinion, it's not anymore an something like a boom. Uh, yeah. Nowadays, we are living in the, the era that we have some outcomes. We, two, three, four, five, six years. Mm -hmm. And we know that things, of course, they're not perfect. And uh, mm -hmm. of course, my opinion, and even all my residents, they, they work with me, they have a very big bias or bias yeah. because I do always preservation in primaries. Yes. So, and I always tell them, you have to go to somewhere to learn structure because it's the beginning of everything. Yeah. In yeah. my opinion, you have to structure, to know how to structure, of course. So how has your technical side of rhinoplasty changed over the last few years? Because you're always innovating and you're always wanting to make some changes. But if you look back at like, dial back maybe five years ago and you were still with the, the Schieder Ferreira technique, etc. Have things changed apart from the settle advancement flap or some other things that you think you could have done better or you are doing better now? We are improving the stability of the spare roof B uh, because we are having some issues, you know, like uh, the way we do the subdorsal osteotomy or ostectomy. Mm -hmm. We are improving it again with the Faculty of Engineering. We study a lot because sometimes we cannot achieve really green stick fracture. Mm -hmm. I mean, nowadays I achieve it in 95% of the cases. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. It seems easy, but it's not easy to achieve a green stick fracture. No. And I would say that in the in the beginning you will have near one hundred percent of real fracture that we don't want. So uh, that's it. We are doing some refinements on, on the technique with this septal advancement flap. It changes a little bit. Uh, it's not exactly a high strip. Okay, it's a kind of in between a middle and a high strip. And uh, so we are improving and our consistency is being very, very good because the outcomes of the, we still use the probes, the Utrecht questionnaire, mm -hmm. and our consistency is very good. I'm, I'm very happy with the results. And I, I always do in all my primaries, I always do the Asperus mm -hmm. B or the A, if it is really a, a, a SJP nasal bores. Mm -hmm. We are uh, wondering to do something new about the apparatus cartilages soon. I will tell you. Awesome. Yes. Okay, so Miguel, last question. Like, um, as we kind of bring this season to an end, is if people, and I mean, you teach a lot around the world, but if people want to come and visit you in Porto and come and learn from you, is there that possibility? Yes, of course. Well, I don't have a program. Specifically, I don't have a program. I work in three different settings, you know, one public and two private. Yeah. I can manage a private, it's okay. The public, uh, it's a fixed day, and okay. uh, uh, typically on Thursdays. And, uh, well, I don't have a specific program. Typically, they text me, and uh, I say, this week I will be in Porto, so you can join me, and maximum two, three fellows 
oh, more than that. And uh, well, that's it. I'm not so organized in receiving uh, people, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, sometimes I, well, it's very, I'm, I feel a little bit proud because uh, I would say 50-50, 50% they are seniors. And I, I, yes, I, I feel really yeah. proud because of that. Yeah. Yes. You know, people that they are surgeons like, like us and they and are very experienced. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, and this guess, and I learned a lot with that, that kind of, uh, you know, very high uh, graduated fellows. They are not fellows. Yeah. And uh, well, it's really very good for me. Awesome. Man. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. So, guys, uh, that kind of brings us to the end of the season. And the two thank yous that I have. Actually, there are three thank yous. The first one is to my technical team with what they, they put this thing together. Guys, thank you. Guys from Perfect Circle. The second thank you is to each of the speakers who take their time to sit here and listen to my questions. It's, I mean, we've had like 30 interviews this season. It's amazing. And then I think the last final thank you is to say thank you to you guys who uh, listen. If it wasn't for people wanting to listen to the stuff, we wouldn't do it. So, guys, thank you very much. Tell your friends to listen to the Rhinoplasty podcast. And gear up for next year when we do season four, and I think it's going to be called Digging for Gold. We want to get some nuggets out of the practices. So that's it. My uh, season three has come to an end, and thank you so much. Eh? Miguel, thank you for bringing thank it you. to a close for us. Eh? Great. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube, because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests.